evening, everybody. Welcome to the School District of Waukesha's um, Board Safety and Security Committee meeting. To begin, have we been properly posted? Yes, we have. Thank you, dear. And um, our next item on the agenda is opportunity for citizens to speak. Would anyone care to address the committee? Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Paul, Paul Reese, 841. All right, that's my old, Peter. that's my old, oh my God. I am sorry about that. I have to figure this out. There. Sorry about that. Um, I was listening on the way here. Um, I want to talk a little bit about, you know, the security thing that was just passed in that in, in regards to how much, not to how much we're spending, but what's going on. And a false sense of security sometimes this gives people. We think that we can stop something that can't be stopped, an evil that just lurks, that finds ways to get past things. Um, I've watched the presentations that have been given and I often wonder, you know, like Columbine, where can someone open another door? Can it be open? We should talk about putting doorways in hallways. Can they be jammed? Can they be blocked? Can a duffel bag or something be placed in the way and prevent it from closing? Um, what about fire alarms? How do they work with fire alarms? When a fire alarm is pulled, is, are they locked in? Are they, are they restricted in? You know, there's, there's all sorts of questions I have about things like this when we do things um, that change the procedure of how, how people naturally want to flow. And there's reasons why we can't lock people in when fire alarms are pulled. You know, for obvious reasons, um, uh, I, you know, I, I have children, and, and getting shot at school is about the least of my problems and worries. I worry about the things that that I know lurk, the evil that I know lurks. I know what drugs do to people, and I, I've seen it, and I've, I, have, I have a lot of friends and the friends that I've known who died, and people I've known who died behind the wheel of a car. Uh, isn't even comparable. I, I know one person kind of who messed around with a gun and shot himself in the arm and bled to death. One, and I know a lot who have died in car accidents and drug overdoses at young ages. And those things scare to me to death. Those are the things. And we get overlooked on something. Here's this shiny thing. And that's not what I'm worried about. That's not what I worry about with my kids. I, 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 I there's, there's a movie out called Beautiful Boy about a kid who gets hooked on heroin. Something like that scares the, me to death. You know, this doesn't even, it's, it's not even on my radar. I know it's possible, but it's, it's almost, Im the possibilities are almost improbable. It just, it grabs headlines because it's so rare and gruesome, but the death toll from, from drug addiction is every day, and therefore it's not even looked at. And I look at people on the streets, people who are homeless, and I realize that someone bore them, someone held them one time, someone cared, and what these drugs have done to them. And that's what scares me. So thanks for your time. Thank you. All right, <clears throat> excuse me. Our next um, agenda item is an action item, so the approval of the minutes from the September meeting. Do I hear a motion? So moved. I'll second that. Great. Any discussion? None? All right. Um, Can I make a discussion? Yes, please. Correction. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. We just thought you were donating yeah. a, a few. <sighs> okay. All right, given that correction, um, all in favor for approval, say aye. 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 Great, passes 3-0-1. Thank you. Thank you. Continuing on with the agenda, we have information items this evening. Um, Dr. Cook, would you please update us on the uh, status of the school safety grants? Yes. Um, so uh, as, as we've talked about, we've been awarded, um, we were awarded a, a funding in, in rounds one and round two of the safety grant. Um, the work uh, that we 
um, that we started around in grant round one with safety film and making sure that the perimeters of our buildings uh, are secure is ongoing work. Um, we said that that was going to be ongoing. Uh, we do have the front door areas of our buildings covered, um, and that's spreading around the perimeter of the building towards the other, other doors uh, as well. Um, we have begun the process of, of, of getting the bids on building segmentation, so creating some of those secure entrance pathways into our building, similar to what uh, uh, Mary talked about last night at Banting. That is in the works as well. In the second round of the safety grant, we did put in for door strike software to indicate to, to office staff if, if, the, um, if the doors are propped, if they're open, um, when they could be open uh, and such. And so that is in process as well. So the, the grant work is, is started. It is well on its way. We anticipate that its completion will come sometime around the end of June with those physical improvements in the district. That is not referring to the work that was covered under the referendum. That is strictly the safety grant work. Yes, sir. So the segmentation, yep. is some of that gonna be done under the referendum though? It, it, correct, okay. correct. Some of it is, some of it's under the referendum. What we, what we were trying to do with the safety grant is in, in schools where we could accomplish that secure pathway there are some elementary locations, such as what we did at Banting with an extra set of doors and then routing people into the office. There are a number of locations where we can accomplish that with funding from the grant. And so that's what we're gonna do. And then the, the film, the bullet resist yep. film or whatever, is that gonna be done completely under the grant or are we doing some of that under the referendum? That was all grant work. Oh, grant work. Um, okay. Under the referendum, we may do that in some locations, uh, such as at the middle school, if we're fundamentally altering that flow, we may right. put that film on, or we may order glass with that stalled, installed in the middle of it. Um, okay. Right, you exactly. know, just having it factory installed before the glass is put into the building. Are we doing that just on entrances, the the film, or are we doing that on outside windows, all outside windows, or how are we? We're or? we're looking at that. The, the The grant funding allowed for doorways. Okay. Or the windows are a secondary thing that if the referendum. Oh, and then I do have one other question. I know that when I was on a technology committee, the door prop alarms was going to be actually in the budget for technology. Yes. That's moved out now. And it's going to be covered and, under okay. the grant. Under the yep. grant. Okay. Thank you. We do have some of that, you know, did, it, it, we do have some of that software installed at some of our doorways yes, right, right now. Yeah. You look at your badge, your badge yep. access and stuff. Right. Um, but we're looking at for every door in the district, making sure that that door is monitored. When I, I do have a couple other questions. Go ahead. What, what is the, um, I can't believe there's a policy on it, but I see, me personally, um, see doors propped open at north by the entrance. You know, there's the entrance and then right next to it, it's gotta be the pool. There, the, no doors should be propped open. That is the expectation and that's what's sent to principals and to and custodial staff directors. and athletic directors. Um, I know From time no to time, on coaches the on the weekends um, or during the after school hours, yeah. they may do it, but the expectation is, is that it is closed. And we do address violations of right. that accordingly. Yeah. Okay, thank you. The door striking system, is that integrated into our phone system and other, or is it a completely standalone We'd, system? I, Steve Schloman would be able to provide a better answer to that, but but that techno what the technology affords us is the ability to go from, you know, that all of the doors are closed, that you would have an acceptable delay as to, you know, if people, if it's the entrance by the teacher's parking lot, it, the door should be able to be open so for somebody to go to their car. Right. But if it's open for longer than five seconds or 10 seconds, the office would be notified that it's open so that that door could be addressed. Um, we do have cameras throughout the district, so our doors are monitored by camera, and we have a number of ways to monitor those areas. And someone actu actually has to physically go down and close the door, right? Somebody it's would not... have to physically monitor it. Yep. Yeah. I think it was going to be tied into the phone system or front office and tell them what door is propped. One of my prior Originally. districts, we had this set up, and it was extremely valuable for the, in particular, at the high school level. Um, uh, where where the office was notified immediately when doors were propped open, especially with the vast space at a high school. That's correct. I mean, you look at nice. some, you know, you look at a field house, for instance, where they have massive banks of doors. All of those doors will be monitored. 
so that if somebody does prop it open, we know that it's open and we can address it. And I thought originally our phone system had some of that capability. Well, it didn't have it built in, but right, it we was an add-on, and I just didn't know if we went with that particular system or not, or we will be going working with, with that. Steve Schloman and Heartland on what the Heartland Business Solutions are for for uh, for this project. So, okay, so it doesn't sound like much probably to people listening, but boy, knowing if a door is open or not can make a big difference from a safety perspective. And these strikes, the intention of them is during the school hours, not when there's an after school sports event or a weekend right. event? I, you know, sporting events, and we've, we've had this conversation in around the Raptor program, um, the Raptor software. I mean, that this is to monitor the school day. Um, at our elementary schools, it's to monitor that after school care period as well, uh, as far as having doors propped open. Um, we wanna make sure that an adult, a human, is monitoring when people are in and out of the buildings because, again, with our little ones, you know, with it, we don't want them to be, you know, somebody to remember them to walk off on their own. The um, <coughs> basketball games, choir concerts, the whole business, uh, that's just a different level of security. Um, you have to have your doors open. Those are public events. Uh, they don't have the same, the same scrutiny would not be provided at these times. All right. Discussion? Yeah, just uh, real quick, um, regarding some of the training. Yes. Has that been planned out yet? Are you looking at? We do have that uh, on the, the next item uh, is the uh, in mental health and threat assessment training. And I'll talk a little bit about that. Okay. It's coming up there. All right, well that was a great segue for item um, 3B, the safe, safety training at, that will be held in August. Yeah, so um, I see uh, in, uh, because of our size, uh, we were able to work directly with the Department of Justice <laughs> and the National Association of School Resource Officers uh, to host on-site training for the advanced mental health. So as a, as a condition of the grant, 10% um, of our professional staff must be trained in this advanced mental health uh, 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 module. And, and this is a 12-hour long uh, professional development provided through the Department of Justice. It's gonna be held on site. And so just to give some perspective, 10% of our professional staff is just shy of 100 individuals. So we're gonna have 100, 100 staff members, psych, social workers, counselors, principals, uh, and some teachers who are gonna be trained in, in, in this, this how, to, how, you are, how are you identifying the early signs? Uh, should, should a student be de demonstrating some difficulties? And, and how do you go about dealing with mental health and abuse and, um, and addiction and things like that. How do you notice the signs of that so that you can refer people on to, to get more help? Um, so that is one of the trainings and that's gonna be uh, all day Monday the 26th of August and half the day Tuesday the 27th. That'll give us our 12 hours. And then on Wednesday the 28th um, is gonna be the threat assessment. And we're gonna be able to get up to 150 of our staff members trained in the threat assessment protocol, which again takes those signs that you may be seeing in the classroom um, or at the school level, and it allows staff to identify early triggers if students are demonstrating some concerning behavior. Um, and then again, get those students uh, evaluated and referred on to the appropriate uh, supports um, or interventions so that th you don't run into those major events at your school. So that, that is happening two days, we're hosting it. In your packet, you can see some information from NASRO. Um, on, uh, on what this registration is gonna uh, entail. Um, we were given additional funding to host these trainings. So, um, so as, as a result of the grant, this is not costing the district any additional money, nor is it eating into the grant. It is, this was money that was provided on top of the grant. Um, Dr. Cook, the you stated that 10% of the professional staff, is it's required, can more than 10% of the staff at attend this? Or can the the, um, the mental health is gonna be capped at 100 individuals um, because just do you, we can get 50 people in a training session and we have 100 people that are gonna get trained at that. The threat assessment is up to 150 people. We hope to fill that, but in all practicality, the same 100 people who are trained for the mental health, we would make sure that they're trained in the threat assessment as well. I, um, I had a chance to read through um, 
the content that's going to be taught, it's pretty extensive. Yep. Wow. Um, the, the learning objectives are um, very specific. And, um, you know, I'll tell you, if, if, if you can absorb, <laughs> you know, not, nobody's going to absorb 100% when you go to these things, right? And it takes sometimes a few times hearing things and doing things to and experiencing things to truly learn it. But, boy, this seems pretty comprehensive. Um, and, um, you know, beyond what I thought we would be trained in when we first started talking about this. So who, who developed who developed this? The, uh, this, is, this comes to us from the National Association of School Resource Officers. So it comes from them. And just to give a little perspective, we're, like I said, we're going to have psych, social workers, and counselors. They're really, they have a, a, a deep, deep knowledge of adolescent mental health. So for them, there may be some repeat material in there. But for our administrators, th this is going to be a lot of new information because you've got mental health professionals that work within our district. You're going to be getting administration and student services staff on the same page along with some of our teaching staff. Um, that's going to be key for us so that they have a common understanding of what signs to be looking for and how to provide and facilitate interventions for students when they start to see it instead of, you know, having only a couple people at train, it's going to be a lot of folks. I mean, 10% of our staff is a lot of individuals, um, you know, site by site. And it, yes, sir. And, and it goes beyond just identifying and dealing with the student one-on-one. -on -one. It's the families, the families and the community resources. resources. Um, I mean, this really, this seems very comprehensive. Um, do are there um, are there recommendations by um, the National Association of uh, SROs uh, like to have continuing education on this? So you go through this course, and are there like refreshers every two years or three years or something along those lines? There's no requirement for that from the National Association. What we've done in, in, in Waukesha every year at the beginning of the year and then um, – and then at uh, the Waukesha One Conference, we have had strands of mental health, social and emotional learning for our staff to get. And, and, and so going back to the previous discussion about getting everybody on the same page, we're going to be able to take then what we offer internally and go deeper and deeper with that, with our own staff. So what we're looking to do is capture a baseline and then to continue to provide that education. We've contracted um, through my department for our psych, social workers, counselors, administrators. We've contracted with our legal counsel, um, with uh, wa uh, Waukesha County Family Services, with uh, St. Emilians or St. A's now, um, a lot of agencies to come in and work on trauma-informed care, on adolescent mental health. This is gonna allow us to take that work and continue to go deep. I would say that instead of doing a refresher every two years, we're going to be building this in as ongoing work in Waukesha. This dovetails really nicely. If, if you remember when uh, Todd and I were doing some reporting out last year on our work with the uh, Waukesha County school districts and uh, sheriff's department and police agencies around threat assessment, this dovetails really nicely with that work because um, this is going to give us that foundation to go off of. Well, very good. I am um, appreciative of the funds that have been provided so that we can do these trainings. And yes, a lot of the individuals might already be familiar with it, but refreshers are having it presented in a different way. Cannot hurt. And while we know that we can't seal off everything to protect 100%, we at least know that this is something um, that can help um, in a different way. So thank you for that update. Um, the next item to be um, to, for you to inform us on would, is the update of the Raptor Visitor Management System. So uh, we've talked uh, talked about Raptor for a while now. Um, we are in the final stages of setup and uh, training of staff. And so just as a refresher, um, the Raptor system is a uh, visitor management system that does an automatic uh, background check for sexual predators. Um, it goes through the national database for that. So what you do is when you come to our schools and we'll be rolling this out after the uh, Thanksgiving holiday, 
um, it will go live then. You'd be preventing, presenting a driver's license, a, um, a state-issued ID, uh, a consular ID, anything that has the barcode on it that your driver's license would have on it. And it will do an immediate screen of the National uh, Sex Offenders Database. It will notify administration and uh, the office staff immediately if that person is safe to come into the school or if that person needs to be detained there. Now we have procedures that we're putting in place. We're gonna be working with our office staff on what to do, you know, how to greet somebody, what to do if, if there's an issue that arises um, so that we can ca you know, make sure that our school is staying as safe as possible. This would be a system that's in place during the school day. So this is from eight in the morning until four o'clock in the afternoon. This is something that you know we are gonna use every day, but we're gonna use good discretion, say for instance, when a school has grandparents day. You're gonna have 300 people show up for grandparents day. Grandparents day can't be 13 hours long. So we're gonna use some good sense as to how to use this when we're having a large event at a day, a veterans assembly, whatever it might be. But every operating school day, we're gonna be, we're gonna be scanning everybody who comes in uh, into our schools. We'll be sending some communication out to all of our families uh, next week um, uh, to notify them that this is in fact gonna go live. Uh, this, uh, we will also be submitting something to the Freeman so that that can be communicated throughout. Does this, does this have any, uh, change in, uh, what we do for background checks for volunteers or is that still going to be a separate system that we maintain? That's a separate system that goes into the full criminal background check. This is really to catch anybody who's a predator from coming into our school. Okay. So. Yeah, I was hoping you were going to say that because it's a much greater background check for the volunteers, right? Right. Background yeah. the the background the volunteer background check is is I believe, and Chris Hedstrom could correct me, but I believe it's the same background check we do on employees. So it is a full detailed criminal history. It's not just putting somebody's name into CCAP and seeing what comes up. It is a full detailed report on it on anybody who wants to work with our children. Have we? Uh, have we had any issues where we've had to say no to a volunteer oh, yeah. and they've caused problems? Um, we've had people contest that and appeal that, but the idea of it causing a, a it, we, we do it in a sense, I'm not aware of any problems that have happened at the school. I know that it's caused some meetings for me and Chris. Yes, sir. Um, so do you have to have a state issued ID? You have to have an what if somebody comes from out of state? You have to have an official ID that has that barcode on it. So your, your Minnesota driver's license would get you to scan this. And if you're a person who doesn't have access to a driver's license or a state ID, a consular ID. So issued if you're, if you're here from France and you go to the Fr French, French consulate and you get a French ID, okay, yep. that ID will serve the purpose of scanning you through the Raptor system. Um, but, but you must have an ID. Okay. So, um, so if you don't have an ID, you're not gonna be able to get past this. We do know that there may be some situations where we have a person, a parent, uh, or a grandparent who's got custody of a, of a child. We're not gonna limit those people from attending uh, an IEP, a special education meeting, or parent-teacher conferences, because conferences are happening after school, yep. IEP meetings, we can make sure that they happen in the office. We do not want to limit people from being able to participate in the important things about their child's education, but you're just not gonna have free reign in our school. You know, uh, those, those would require escorts. So if, if somebody doesn't have an ID, they're gonna be brought to the conference room by the principal, um, and, and it's just not free reign in the school. So we have those steps built in to accommodate our community, but again, once you know four o'clock in the afternoon comes and then you're coming in for the winter concert or four o'clock in the afternoon comes and parent teacher conferences begin you're not going to be scanned by raptor at those particular times those aren't it's not for basketball games it's not for concerts it's you know we're not going to bring these units out to the football game right. um this is really to control the flow during the school day in waukesha okay. which is a very it's a common practice yeah. in in many areas school districts um, it takes a couple minutes to get through, um, about two minutes per check. Um, once you're in the system, it goes even quicker. We print out the... 
it it's going to get a little, ID that, little yeah. sticker badge that's yep. got your name on it. It's going to have your driver's license photograph on it. Yep. So if your driver's license photo isn't that desirable, I apologize, but that's how kids are going to see you when you're walking through the halls. How about a passport? Can you use a passport? The barcode? That's the barcode. Okay. It should trigger it. it. Okay. Yep. I'd have to ask Steve for the final details on that. We'll be communicating out what type of identification works. When okay. We communicate I got gotcha. you. Okay. Because I know that there's barcodes on passports because when we went to... I think you had touched on a question that I had. So let's say I'm, I'm in my child's school every day. So every single day I go and I hand them my ID, they're gonna scan me. Um, we, if we have multiple families or parents like that at different schools, it, does that device or does the system store my information or how, how does that work? It, yes, you'll, you'll be in there and it will be refreshed. The only thing that would trigger that is if you were found guilty of something. But if you are a regular volunteer and you filled out the volunteer paperwork, you're the classroom person um, or you're go, you're, you want to supervise the field trips or whatever it is, we're conducting a different background check on you when you hit that status with us. So this Raptor visitor management thing, would you, you would go through, but you may also end up having a volunteer badge from the school district that would get you in to do what it is you need so to that, do. So that would be our verified card. So I have that verified card already, yep. which is nice because so, it gives the expiration date and how long your your check is, your clearance is for. Um, so this would be more, more so for the folks that are just coming in for a one-time thing, that's... You know, so, so, I, so if Mr. McCaffrey were not a school board member and he were not a parent, um, he wanted to come to see uh, the Les Paul garage, he would show up to Les Paul, give him the driver's license, they'd print him out a badge, a badge he could walk down to the Les Paul garage and take a tour. Um, that would be his access for that one day. Um, for a parent who is going to come occasionally to school, the first scan would be the first scan. Uh, maybe they want to have lunch with their kid, uh, whatever it might be. They get scanned in. They want to do that three or four times a year. They would have to scan in each time. The, by having them stored in the system, the check would go quicker because it wouldn't have to do all mm -hmm. the identification pieces. If you're just a one-time visitor, again, it's going to take two or three minutes to get in and go through the software. We have ordered additional Raptor units so that if one of them does go down, we have a replacement in the district that can go in and, and substitute in a rel re relatively short amount of time. Um, excuse me, one second here. Uh, will there be procedures so that every school is going to do this the same? Every school okay. will follow the same written procedures. The only things that will, uh, that will change this is if you go to North High School, for instance, and you walk into the secure foyer, you walk, you go to Banting Elementary School, and you walk into the secure foyer. There's going to be those are going to be a little bit different levels of security as you go in, but Raptor will function the same in each school location. Does uh, Raptor um, also keep track of logs, and are those logs accessible by the principal or other? central office folks so you know okay I, I i woke up i get my pass for the day does that log my name in also and saying when i entered when i left and is that data it accessible the, by others within the district your arrival is for reporting purposes your arrival is recorded uh and it's recorded in our system we have not built in a, de a departure expectation uh, there are some school districts where you have to drop your car keys off. So you go to the school, you do the th scan, you drop the car keys off, and then, um, and then when you check out, you, you, you rescan yourself out and you get your car keys back. We haven't built that expectation in because at our schools at this moment, we don't have that secure entrance right. at, the at, the, at the front of the school. So um, once we build in some of these additional security measures, so as the, as the uh, grant projects go through and we put secure entrances into schools, as the door strike software around the building goes in, as we make the entire school setting more secure, we may look to add that in as a step, but we haven't built the departure piece in as, as part of it yet. Are there any reporting features? So can I, um, you know, I'm a principal, can I look at a report? seeing you know who entered 
uh, during this week or whatever, or how many times, or could I look up a specific person? Oh, that Joe Como. I want to know how many times I Joe Como to, was at the school. I'd have to talk to Steve Schloman about that, and maybe I could ask him to do a report to the uh, technology committee on some of the, the more detailed features of this, that, you know, the reporting, the logging, um, you know, where you could do visitor management, you know, you want to figure out how popular was Grandparents Day. You could, sure. you could go in and take a look at, you know, using the software, how many people were pre-scanned maybe. Um, you could look at that. I think the important thing to know, though, and from my perspective, the most important report from this is when, a, when there is an offender trying to get into our school, it is the immediate alert. I get a text message. The principal gets a text message. I get an email with a photograph of the person who's trying to get into the building. Mm -hmm. And we're looking at putting those next steps in as to making sure that information is relayed to all of our SROs and, and to some of the command at the police department so they know that at Summit View Elementary School, John Doe tried to get in, and it happens immediately when they get scanned. Wow. Um, so that one, the school isn't sitting there, you know, on their own, that multiple people are getting, you know, notified that this is happening. Um, and so that we can be as efficient as we can in reporting that. Placement. You know, the nice thing about Raptor, um, it's a great deterrent. You know, when you, when you know that you've got to go in and present an ID, it is an excellent deterrent to keep people out of the building um, because you're just not going to have that same level of access. And then once you put those other features in place, door strikes, sec more secure uh, perimeters of the building, you know, now you're really enhancing the, the, the safety of your schools. I believe Mr. McCaffrey, you know, you see what they do in... I do see what, yeah, it's Conomawak. fully operational in and and my wife's school, you have to leave your driver's license. And then when you come back out, they scan a code on your, there's a code that's printed on the badge and they can hit that and that's your departure and then you get your license back and you can leave. So you're not slipping out a door in the back because, but yeah, they make you give up your driver's license after they keep it on the desk. It's a, and all the workmen have to, and if you come into the building and you're doing work in here, like you're a contractor, you have to go through the Raptor as well because they don't That's going to be our anything. expectation <laughs> yes. as well. I, so, yeah. you know, for us. Uh, because you never know. For the, the the you know the postal That's employee good. the the postal employee the county worker um, the uh, construction you know the electrician and the plumber the non district electrician and plumber that has to get in um, you know we're going to be coming up on uh, on some major referendum work um, you know in the next so and and all of those people who are on those crews, I mean, just to give you guys an idea, that they're not gonna be scanned by Raptor. Those folks are gonna be having full background checks done by their companies, and they're gonna be walking around with a contractor ID. So the, the people who are present on our campus, are we're gonna make sure that they are right individuals to have on our campus. Sounds good then. There are no listed discussion items on our agenda. So the next item up would be a re other business. Or does anybody have recommendations for future committee meetings? Dying to know. Do we have a like a security plan for like football games or stuff like that? We uh, the athletic directors and I. The the first priority a few years back was to get the crisis management plan done. After we accomplished that, um, that was passed in about December in. June, I met with principals and started to get some feedback on what we had put in place. It was operational for a while. Uh, the athletic directors came back to me and said, we think we need to do something for large events. They, I believe it was in the second year of that plan, so probably three years ago, they put together a large event evacuation procedure um, that we would use uh, at football games, at basketball games, at graduations and such. So. That, for me, that would be the scary thing, is a football game. No. Because it's not only open. No. Uh, and and trapped in a school. Right. And so what we've done is if you, um, and I'd have to go back and, and check it, but we've, when Glenn Norder was still here, we have been very clear with postings around the perimeters of the football fields, and we've given messaging to the person in the booth as to how to, okay. you know, essentially direct traffic right. in the event that something happened. Anything else? All righty. Well, um, our next Safety and Security Committee meeting is scheduled for Thursday, December 20th um, at 6 p.m. here in the board meeting, or board meeting, excuse me, boardroom. 
Um, with that, our meeting is adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>